Next week, we begin our second tour of Latin America this year. For the next six weeks, we will be holding crusades in Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. The revolutionary changes in Latin America have made these evangelistic crusades imperative at this period of history. This is the most explosive continent on earth, where the population is increasing faster than anywhere in the world. South America comprises 20 highly individualistic, independent nations. These countries do not speak with a single voice. Together they make up a chorus, often harmonious in the United Nations, but sometimes tragically discordant at home. To think of all of Latin America as a unit or to treat these countries as if they were a single nation or a single people brings misunderstanding and confusion. While these 20 countries share a common background of Iberian culture, a common religion, and a frontier freshness, yet they're as different as an Eskimo is different from a Wall Street businessman. In varying degrees, these countries are all plagued with poverty, illiteracy, hunger, ill health, inflation, political corruption, and economic backwardness. An old Spanish feudal society is still trying to hold on to the vast land areas. Although a middle class is developing, the chasm between rich and poor often seems to be growing wider instead of narrower. The moods of the peoples of Latin America can be described in one word, impatient. They're impatient to receive all the material benefits which the American movies have portrayed in a Hollywood style of living. The vast majority of people on the east coast of South America live where we begin our crusades next week in Sao Paulo. They live within 200 miles of the coast. Unlike the many urban centers of the United States where the suburban areas are often more populous than the cities themselves, the cities of South America end abruptly at the outskirts. For centuries, rural Latin Americans have grouped themselves in small towns and villages where they live within themselves, shut off from the rest of the world. The provincialism of physical isolation expresses itself in an attitude of pride mixed with distrust. Pervading all the mistrust is the fear of so-called Yankee imperialism and European big business. This distrust is so deep and so widespread and of such long standing that it may ultimately destroy intra-American relations. Our State Department has done its best to bring about better relationships with the countries of South America. But as most officials agree, we are 25 years too late. There's gloom and pessimism almost everywhere over the development of the Alliance for Progress. The United States finds itself on the wrong side in some countries. At least four nations are on the verge of a communist takeover within the next 18 to 24 months. Communism is spreading rapidly everywhere. Underneath the surface, they're fomenting strife. Recently, they've come out in the open even to machine gunning the residents of the Archbishop of Rio de Janeiro. All this political and economic confusion has created a philosophical, religious, and political vacuum. Unless a dynamic, vital, reformed Christianity moves in quickly, then other forces will control the South America of tomorrow. In Sao Paulo, where we begin our meetings next week, probably more work, more prayer, more tears, and more sacrifice have gone into the preparation of these crusades than in any part of the world where we have gone. Churches of all denominations are cooperating. Sao Paulo is one of the largest and most prosperous cities in the world. It is a boom town, desperately in need of a spiritual awakening. The Christians of Brazil have their eyes riveted on Sao Paulo, praying that this crusade may be the spark which ignites a mighty revival which would sweep all of Brazil. We need the prayers of Christians everywhere that the Holy Spirit will use these meetings to fan the embers, to bring a spiritual awakening to believers, and to win those outside of Christ to himself. As we stand on the threshold of another venture of faith, it is with a sense of humility and dependence on the Spirit of God. I do not particularly want to leave the United States at this time. There are great American cities which have invited us, many colleges and universities. The social, moral, and spiritual problems of the great metropolitan areas of the United States are becoming more acute with every passing day. The next five years could well be the most crucial time in American history. 
Many changes will occur, and there's always the possibility that a spark will be ignited to touch off a third world war that could destroy many of the great cities of our nation. Yet in spite of our own country's great need, we believe that the Lord has mysteriously and wondrously led us to South America at this time. There's peace in our hearts as we prepare to board the plane this week. We believe we're obeying the last command of our Lord when he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The words of this passage are the words of the risen Christ, who had just rebuked his disciples for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Yet in 1962, with all the tremendous facilities at our disposal for obeying his final command, unbelief prevails in the hearts of many of his people. If men who profess his name actually believed what our Lord has said about the condition of men outside of Christ and about the spiritual condition of the world in which we live, there would be wholehearted obedience to this commission. The fact that multiplied millions at this very hour have never so much as heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ indicates that this task is still unfinished. No one familiar with the Bible can deny that Christianity is basically evangelistic and missionary in character. The church was to be deeply concerned with the proclamation of the evangel. The nature of God himself is evangelistic, for we read that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ himself was evangelistic in that he turned his back on the ivory palaces of glory to come to this earth to die for man's redemption. His whole life was spent in spreading the gospel, in making God known to the sons of men. He was an itinerant preacher, going from one of part of the Middle East to the other, never sparing himself to do so. The whitened harvest was ever before his eyes, and he kept it before the gaze of his followers. Christ did not leave the world until he had made provision for the furtherance of his saving message. The New Testament does not leave the question of missions and evangelism debatable. It does not matter whether we approve or disapprove. I heard of an officer who commanded a private to do a certain duty and met with the answer, it is impossible. The officer said, I did not ask you for your opinion, but for your obedience. With the clear, specific command of our Lord before us, there is nothing for us but obedience. In many church councils today, there's a debate going on as to whether we should continue our missionary activity around the world. There are churches now in the World Council of Churches, especially from Eastern Europe, which do not believe in missions and evangelism. They say that we should withdraw our missionaries. There's a small minority of churchmen who talk about syncretism or forming one great religion out of all the religions of the world. The way of Jesus Christ is exclusive. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. The early apostles said, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Christ himself said, go ye. And he said that we are to go to the whole world, not just to our own community or our own nation, but to all the world because the whole world needs to be saved. Whether people live in South America, India, Africa, or Europe, they need Jesus Christ. No matter what their other religious beliefs may be, they need Jesus Christ if they are to be redeemed. God has called all of his people to leap over geographical boundaries to catch the vision of what Jesus meant when he said, the field is the world. John Wesley once said, the whole world is my parish. So today, we head for South America to preach the gospel to thousands of people in obedience to the command of our master. I've reached the age when it is no longer easy to say goodbye to my family for weeks at a time. Yet I have been commanded by the commander-in-chief of the armies of the Lord to go into all the world and I must obey. It has now been my privilege to preach the gospel on every continent and we shall continue going throughout the world proclaiming Jesus Christ and him crucified as long as God gives us breath. Our purpose in going is to preach the gospel. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. In many places today, education or civilization is being substituted for evangelization. However, I believe that civilization and education without God simply adds to the confusions and burdens of the people. This is one of the dangers of the Peace Corps. Wherever social and educational changes are essential to Christian living, they will come as a result of the preaching of the gospel of Christ. God has ordained that the foolishness of preaching would be used to save those who believe. 
The scripture says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The apostle Paul faced a pagan world with a simple gospel. And without apology, he proclaimed it because he knew something of its power to transform not only the individual, but society. He could write, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The gospel which Paul preached was utterly foreign to unregenerate men. It aroused the antagonism of the world, the flesh, and the devil. But Paul had received a command, and he was determined to declare this gospel to all men everywhere, whatever the cost. He traveled back and forth throughout the ancient world, urging men to believe in Christ for salvation. For 12 years it has been my privilege to preach this gospel in most of the countries of the free world. Whatever the cost, we must obey the command to go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. This is the reason that the ministry of the hour of decision is worldwide. This is the reason we spend part of our time every year in foreign lands preaching the gospel. This is why we're beginning to translate our magazine decision into several languages to spread the gospel to as many people as possible through literature while there's yet time. There are those who try to talk us out of leaving the country at this time. They say the finances will not come in to support your work while you're gone. Others tell us that America needs the gospel more. I remember that friends sought to dissuade John Payton from entering upon the insane project of carrying the gospel to the New Hebrides. They told him, the people are cannibals, they will kill you and eat you. But that noble man of God answered, it is decreed that worms at last will eat my body if I die a natural death. If in obeying my master's call it is eaten by men, that is not my concern. The life of that long neglected people was reclaimed and redeemed and today multitudes of them are devout Christians. Some time ago at a missionary meeting, contributions were requested for the cause of missions in India. The plates were heaped with coins and banknotes. In the offering was a card put into the plate by a young man on the back seat. On the card he had written one word, myself. He had given more than all the rest. He gave himself. As we go to South America this week, we are asking you Christians to pray with us and stand with us week by week by your prayers. We need your help by your prayers and interest if this ministry is to continue. But to those of you that have never known Jesus Christ as Savior, you have never been born again by his Holy Spirit, I am asking you to receive the same Christ that I'm offering to the people in South America. As we go to the great cities along the east coast of South America, we need your prayers but we believe that God is going to answer them in the salvation of souls. But there are many people praying right now all over the world that as this message is preached, that many of you that are listening will turn to Christ before it is too late. Give him your life. Put yourself on the altar for him. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that the Spirit of the living God will have his way in our hearts and lives. Encourage Christians to give and pray and we pray that many will turn from death unto life and from darkness to light this day as they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ in Latin America. For we ask it in his name. Amen.